Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. The wars of Indian removal in Florida placed enormous stress on Seminole families, forcing them to often live life on the run. Even so, they still needed a place to rest and recover, but constructing shelters risked detection by soldiers. They knew there was little point in dedicating exorbitant time and resources to building elaborate structures only to have to abandon them when soldiers arrived and who subsequently burned Seminole homes to the ground anyway. They required a sturdy yet supple structure, amenable to both the Florida climate and to available resources. They needed something that didn't require nails either, as available lead went to making rifle rounds for combat against soldiers. They needed something that can be constructed with little effort from available materials. They needed a flexibly employed building called a chicky. It was multi-purpose, able to serve as home, workshop, or kitchen for its mobile Seminole owners. Although this unique structure has evolved over the decades, many Seminoles still call it home in one fashion or another. In this episode, we examine the Seminole Chicky. We describe Chickies in architectural terms. We document their prevalence and use on major Seminole reservations. We explore their changing roles over the last two centuries, especially during the Seminole Wars period. And we discuss the economic, cultural, social, environmental, and political meanings of Chickies in Seminole communities and across South Florida. Joining us to provide her cultivated insights about Chickies is Carrie Dilly. Carrie is the Visitor Services and Development Manager for the Atatiki Museum, as well as the Architectural Historian for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. She is the author of Thatched Roofs and Open Spaces, The Architecture of Chickies and Their Changing Role in Seminole Society, the first systematic study of Chickies. Carrie furnishes us with an informative and detailed exploration of Chickies at the intersection of architectural history and cultural analysis. Carrie Dilly, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks so much for having me. Carrie, to start off with, what is a Chiki? And how do we pronounce it right? <laughs> well, actually, um, Chiki is appropriate, um, although in the Mikusuki language it would be pronounced a little bit differently. Um, so something like chiget. Um, but typically, uh, for most of us, we, we call them chickies. Seminoles traditionally lived in chickies are these open-sided, um, thatch roof structures. So chicky literally translates to home in the Seminole Miccosukee languages. What are the physical aspects of the Seminole chicky? So chickies do resemble what most people think of as a tiki hut. They're made from sable palmetto for the roof thatch and cypress for the structural frame. Um, as I mentioned before, they are open-sided, so they have no walls traditionally. So people are often shocked when they imagine um, someone sleeping and living in an open structure um, in South Florida. But it's important to keep in mind the specific environment that we're in. And I think that chickies brilliantly take full advantage um, of the environment and particularly with the cross breezes. So without walls, without um, other enclosures, they're really quite comfortable, especially uh, due to those breezes. So for the chickie, the posts are set into the ground about three feet or more for structural stability. Um, so I mentioned they're built um, from cypress trees. So the bark was traditionally left on the post. Um, but today, we mostly see them stripped um, if cypress is used. And a lot of chicky builders now use pressure-treated pine for the up upright posts due to the ease of accessibility. Chickies today are held together with nails, but in the days before nails uh, were wide widely available, the posts would have been notched and the thatch would have been tied down. Most chickies are rectangular in shape and have a gabled or hipped roof with a relatively steep slope that helps with the rain that's you know, very prevalent in, in the environment. The thatching, it comes down far enough that you often have to duck down to enter a chickie, especially in the, the more traditional one. Um, and today we see the tradition, the chickies, um, they're capped with a ridge plate, and you'll see some small logs that act as weights um, to hold that ridge cap in place. The chickie does not have a clear and distinct origin. What makes it difficult to determine its origin? So 
when studying architectural history or history in general, I think it's a very Western perspective to try to put uh, definitive dates on things, to try to analyze when something began, um, to try to quantify that. But in many traditional cultures, these things are arbitrary. You know, time and dates and determining when something started in these terms would not be significant. And the chickies, uh, they've always been in use. So if something has always been utilized, um, how do you really put a, a, a date on that? We see them, and we see the open sides, and we wonder, so are they sleeping on the ground? But that's not the case. No, definitely not. There were different chickies for different purposes. So, for instance, there were sleeping chickies, and underneath the sleeping chickie, you would find a platform that was raised, um, you know, approximately three feet off the ground. So that's going to raise it enough off the ground to keep it um, dry and, you know, to keep the ground-dwelling critters uh, away and to keep the, the sleeper safe. Well, at one time, Seminoles lived in log cabins or in huts elsewhere in Florida. Why did they change? This is something that I've certainly kind of reconsidered since my book came out. And now I understand a little bit more clearly that, yes, the ancestors of Seminoles who descended from the creeks did live in these wooden structures and places in northern and central Florida. Um, this has been verified through oral histories and written accounts. However, the ancestors of the Miccosukee Seminoles were always in the Everglades. They're always in the location where they are now. So I do believe that the Chiki in some way has always formed their architectural identity. Why were Chikis particularly well suited to the Seminole during the Florida removal wars? Imagine being on the run, trying to hide and to stay safe. Um, you first of all would want a home that blended in um, but also one that was built for materials right around you. So you didn't have access to bring things in. Um, so you wanted something that could be built quickly in a matter of days, and it could be abandoned um, when the need arose, which was often rather quickly. So the chicky was perfect um, for that situation. You know, the materials were readily available, and they could be erected in a matter of days, especially with a couple people working together the materials. And I didn't see that nails became part of chicky building until about the 1920s. You mentioned a little bit, and I'll come by here formally to ask, what were some of the functions of different chickies? And how did they aid the ever-moving Seminole during the wars? When I envision the chicky, the iconic chicky, I'm picturing it within the camp setting. So each chicky functioned as a specific place for a particular activity, like the separate rooms in a house. So within the camp setting, you would find a cooking chicky, which is pretty much the most significant component. You would find dining chicky, you would find the sleeping chickies that I referred to earlier, um, spaces for storage, etc. The cooking chicky was really unique and very important um, as the heart of the camp. It's where everyone came together. It was really the central location, and it actually looked different, too, um, especially the cooking chickies that we think of today. The rest of the chickies are enclosed by roof thatching. The cooked chicky has open ends or maybe just open pockets within the thatch for ventilation. For my best estimation, during the wartime, the chickies are much simpler. Um, they used fewer palm fronds. They had these gabled roofs with open ends, yet the fire was still really the heart of, of the gathering. Even if it wasn't, you know, the formal kind of camp arrangement that we think of a little bit later, it was still a central component to Seminole life at that time. Because it was used for materials nearby. Is this why it's so hard to study the archaeological record of Seminole chickies during the war period? Yeah, definitely. So um, chickies have been pretty much impossible to substantiate through the archaeological record due to their use of these organic materials, especially when there were no nails used and the little impact they leave on their site. There's no massive construction undertaking. They just eventually return to the earth once they have outlived their useful life or after they were abandoned. So the useful life of a chickie, let's say the roof thatching lasts about five to seven years and about 20 or more years for the upright post. But the earlier chickies weren't um, set as deep into the ground, the ones that were erected quickly. So one could stumble across the, the abandoned um, structure and not necessarily know that it was a chickie necessarily. Carrie, what must we rely on in place of a more complete architectural record to understand what a chickie looked like or its function back then? 
there are no architectural plans or renderings created by Seminoles um, in order to understand the construction of a chiki. The building methods and techniques, they were passed through family lines, um, through oral tradition, and really through hands-on learning. So the oral histories have been the most critical piece of the puzzle. I talked to numerous Chiki builders and tribal members who, uh, who grew up living in Chiki. Um, I also found the oral history collection at the University of Florida very helpful, and also through the stories that were told through the Seminole Tribune. So those are some great resources. Also, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the amazing collection we have at the Athothiki Museum. We have an incredible collection of photos and newspaper articles and just tons of documentation that really help put the story together. And I think some historic sketches and photographs also help build the story. Clay Macaulay's study in 1887 um, features a great sketch of a sleeping chickie. And then we have Ernst. Um, photo of the Pine Island settlement of the 1890s. That kind of shows the difference between the earlier chickies that we're talking about during the war period and then the more permanent natures of the chickies a little bit later. In the early 1900s, you have the Julian Dimmock photos. Um, he served as the photographer for the American Museum of Natural History, and he was sent to document the Seminole Indian settlement. And these houses, are, uh, these photos are housed at the American Museum of Natural History. But a couple years ago, our museum put together an exhibit featuring these photos and the book put together by uh, Gerald Milanich and Nina Root. And I think they really capture the essence of camp and um, the Everglades chickies. At the museum, you could go on a nature walk. Maybe it's five kilometers around and you can see examples of chickies. Which style are they emulating? So we actually have a couple, I think we have something like 30 chickies on our campus. Don't don't quote me on that. Um, we have a lot of chickies there. So in our parking area, um, we have some just bull chickies. They're not really replicating um, any particular use, but they're used for dining. Um, actually, we do have a cooking chickie out there. So that's a really cool one um, with the pocketed opening. And then along the boardwalk, well, actually directly behind the museum, we have a really long rectangular shiki that we use for um, events and school groups and things like that. So once you actually go on the boardwalk, we have kind of replicated um, shiki settings, if you will. So we have our ceremonial grounds. So we have a couple of different chickies there. The amphitheater chickie is not really mimicked after anything, um, but we have a couple of other um, chickies that would be in the style that would be seen at the green corn ceremony. And then just a few steps away from that, we have our recreated um, living village. So that's modeled after tourist camps of the first third to half of the 20th century. So we have the the cooking chicky, which of course is the critical component, and you'll often see the fire that's lit there. And then we have a couple of other chickies centered around that, where you'll find Seminole artisans making traditional crafts. So it's set up similar to a tourist camp from that era. And then also a little further along on the boardwalk, we have our hunting camp. So we have um, an A-frame style chicky and then a lean-to chicky. So those would have been modeled after the temporary chickies built for um, hunting purposes. So those wouldn't have been a critical part of the main camp. So those would have been kind of seasonal or when um, Seminoles would go hunt, they would erect those temporary chickies. What comprised the Sam Jones chickie? The Sam Jones chickie was really the simpler, more streamlined version um, of the chickie that I mentioned earlier with the, the gabled roof and the steeply sloping sides. So this would have been, um, you know, something that wasn't super permanent. It was like a temporary chickie that would have been erected during the war period. After the wars, what was the difference between Seminole towns and Seminole camps, and how did their chickies differ? The camp, as I kind of mentioned earlier, really defined, to me, the essence of the chicky. The chickies in the camps are more solidly constructed. They're more permanent, although they could still be and were abandoned as needed um, or as camp locations moved. They encompass the extended family through the mother's lineage. So extended families lived in these camps together. So when a couple married, they went to live with the wife's family's camp. You know, lots of married siblings, females, and their families and kids lived together um, in these camp settings along with the grandparents. And to me, the Seminole town was more an amalgamation of all the Seminoles in that area 
whereas the camps are really those family familial units. What was the seminal strategic arrangement in Chicky camps that reflected their cultural belief system? For this, I'll give you um, a couple of examples that are commonly shared. For a lot of the deeper cultural reasons, I didn't really ask. Um, I didn't feel like that was appropriate for me to do as a non-seminal. So the cooking chicky, and more specifically the cooking fire, is the heart of the camp. So all other chickies were arranged around the central point. Another strategic arrangement is the sleeping chicky. The bed must be positioned with your head facing east. And I found a really interesting quote from James Billy, um, who spoke about this in the Seminole Tribune. And this was the reasoning. So he said, The old ones believed that when you cross over or die, your soul heads west toward the sunset or darkness, eventually getting into the Milky Way and enter life eternal. When you sleep, it is believed that your soul wanders away from your body and mingles with other souls. If you lie with your head to the east, your position repels souls from being near you. If you lie with your head to the west, you will attract souls to come to you and influence your soul to go with them on their journey to the other souls. This will cause you to be without a soul in your body. You will be soulless with no direction, confused, and make those around you miserable. So to prevent this, you simply lie with your head to the east. I thought that was a really interesting explanation of that arrangement. How did the chicky structure change in the 1880s? Around this time, after the so-called war period ended, chicky camps became more settled. Chickies were built a little sturdier, and one thing I noticed in particular was a shift from gabled roof to hipped roof, as we see in the Pine Island Settlement photo. I know those are architectural terms. Probably most people know what those uh, two different types of roofs are. But imagine um, the palm fronds, instead of just coming um, in a triangle, now they're also in the front of that triangle. So that would be the hipped roof. So it's going to require a lot more thatching, a lot more palm fronds. And the chickies, they're more structurally sound. They're put deeper into the ground. And they're really building up their camp. How did today's tourist chickies differ and why? Most of the chickies I encountered during my survey of the Big Cypress Reservation, I saw there's a lot more flexibility and creativity expressed in the construction. You might see chickies built with walls, you see ceiling fans, other conveniences, um, electricity, etc. So a lot of the chickies that are for tourists to see, say for example at Billy Swamp Safari, guests can rent and sleep overnight in the chickies there. But those chickies have walls. So that's very different from um, an authentic Everglades experience. It's pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty close, but it's not quite the same as a real open-sided chicky. Some other locations, I saw the posts that are painted in stripes of medicine colors. So at the museum, for our tourists to see some of the chickies, we have the bark left on um, the post, which is, you know, the really traditional way. And we try to make sure that they're built from um, cypress instead of pressure treated pine. Some of them are, but the really authentic chickies we have on our campus are built from cypress. And for the past several decades, actually, I believe since the 1950s, chicky building turned into a business for a lot of Seminole builders to capitalize on the desire for many people, non-Seminoles, to have chickies in their backyards, at their businesses, etc. And so we see a ton of chickies in South Florida, and it's still a big business for some Seminoles today, although business has declined um, over the years due to competition from non-native builders. Somebody can start a business building huts. They can't call them chickies, but they could be huts. They could be kind of similar to a chickie, and they might price it a little bit differently. And in someone's backyard, they might go with the lowest price or, you know, make their decisions based upon other things. So there's a lot more competition for actual Seminole tribal chickie builders. Is there a state law that mandates for it to be called a chickie a Seminole has to construct it? Yeah, there actually is. So chickies are defined, and they're actually exempt from Florida Building Code. But in order for a chickie to be a chickie, an actual chickie, um, it has to be constructed by a Seminole or Miccosukee tribal member. can't have any electricity, plumbing. So those are kind of the hallmarks of what makes a chickie a chickie. And then further, they're protected under the um, Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990. If another builder comes along and they say, oh, I want to build chickies, they can't call them chickies. They have to say, um, I, I see a lot of builders here call them like tiki huts or something like that. 
Um, so they're definitely protected under federal law and then exempt from the Florida Building Code as outlined. Imagine that a federal and state law were designed to benefit the Seminole. How times have changed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of people are trying to fight the exemption. So I know that's something, I don't know if it's been overturned, but I know that's something that a lot of people are not in favor of. Within the Seminole in Florida, there's a Seminole tribe, there's the Miccosukee tribe, and there's the independent Seminole. How do their chickies differ from one another, if at all? I think the biggest thing that I was kind of informed of was, um, so for instance, the way that the roof is sat. One builder in particular, he told me the direction that he thatches is based upon the way that culturally he dances at the corn, green corn ceremony. So I think um, whether you look under a chickie and you see if it's thatched to the left or to the right or if it's kind of a zigzag pattern, um, all those are kind of, I don't know if it would be differences between, you know, the Seminole, Mikasuki or Independence. I don't think it's that. But I think those would be based upon other parts of the cultural system. And I don't really know the details of that. I don't know if it's based on the clan. But I think inherently they're going to be pretty similar. You know, a lot of independent Seminoles actually uh, on the Tamiami Trail in particular, they were living in Chickies much, much later. And they were kind of more adapted and modified kind of as uh, what we would consider a modern home. Um, sometimes they had enclosures and things like that. So why is it bittersweet for some Seminoles to move from chicky houses to modern houses? So I think really, as I was kind of mentioning, this camp is like the center of this cultural essence. So when you're breaking that up, um, it's a very hard thing for a lot of people because you're losing part of the culture. So if you have your extended family um, all living together in this camp setting, and then all of a sudden you're moving into a single family home, you don't have that same interaction. So things like language and tradition, they're not as easily passed on. Um, a lot of a lot of elders in particular really found it hard to, to move out of their chickies because that's the only life they had ever known. And I've seen a lot of accounts that Seminoles are actually healthier living in chickies. And then, you know, there were more issues that arose after moving into these modern homes. And they really tried to, in some cases, modify them by knocking out windows to get the same kind of cross breezes. So imagine you're in the 1950s or 1960s, there's no air, condi air conditioning in your home. You're used to this amazing, you know, open-sided structure, getting these cross breezes, and then all of a sudden you're in this cramped 1,200 square foot home. It's a very, very different experience. But I think, like I said, most importantly, it was in a lot of ways um, leading to a breakdown of culture, a loss of culture. Some of the kids were really excited about moving into houses similar to where their schoolmates lived. So a lot of kids that went to school off reservation. They were really excited uh, that they could do their homework with electricity and lighting and things like that. But I think it's still, it was definitely a big change in terms of the maintaining culture. Why do you contend that chickies have remained central to Seminole identity, even as they've evolved to meet current needs without losing their cultural integrity? I think just the sheer number of chickies that there are on the reservation, they're found at most of the homes and other buildings you know, they show how important and central they are to culture. Although on the reservation, I don't believe anyone lives in a chickie, at least not on the Seminole reservations, it's understood that you should have one at your home. Cultural tradition mandates that every home must have a cooking chickie, according to one builder that I interviewed. This is where the culture is shared. And I think also recognizing the significance of the chicky at the green corn ceremony, which really isn't discussed to non-Seminoles. Chicky building is really an important part of preparing for the ceremony. So I think that shows how tight it is to culture and cultural integrity. Although chickies are primarily utilitarian structures, how can we also understand their present-day power as symbols and materializations of seminal cultural identity? The chickies that I survey also represent artistic expression. Chicky builders were experimenting with new shapes, new materials, new uses. You know, I see this as an evolution of culture, so it's not a dramatic departure. 
but it's kind of changing with the cultural times as well. You see it in other other forms of artistic expression. So they, they moved away from that utilitarian nature, and they could be pretty much anything that um, the builder could envision or the owner wanted. There was a lot more freedom. Carrie, until your book, there'd never been a systematic study of chickies. Why was that? I feel like Native American architecture is lumped into the category of vernacular architecture. Oftentimes, it simply does not receive the notoriety that it deserves. Um, especially in the study of architectural history, I think there's this focus on monumental architecture. Prior to my book, chickies were written about and they were studied in a smaller measure as a piece of seminal culture as a whole. But I think within my role, um, especially within the TIPO, I could systematically focus on the architectural significance of chickies. And even a hundred years ago, they were pretty much the only manifestation of seminal architectural expression. You know, there wasn't another architectural history. They were one in the same with seminal architectural history. So, you know, I think just being able to, um, to bring that to light has been, has been really amazing. Some of our listeners may be tempted to have a chicky built on their property. Any idea how they would go about contacting the reservation to find out who could do that? There are definitely a lot of Seminole Chicky Builders. I think you could call myself <laughs> when I'm back at the office, and I could pass along some recommendations. But yeah, I think it's, it's amazing. And, you know, there are plenty of opportunities to, to have a Chicky built on your property. Uh, you said to contact you. I don't know if you want to give the email out. No, they can email me. That's totally fine. Okay, so what's that email? C-A-R-R-I-E-D-I-L-L-E-Y at S-E-M-T-R-I-B-E dot com. So that's Carrie Dilly. There's no dots in there, no dashes. No dots, no spaces, nothing. Carrie Dilly at Semtribe dot com. Granted, this is a featured episode on chickies, but I would remiss if I did not ask about the significance of the Red Barn. What is the Red Barn? How did it come to be? Where is it? And what purpose does it serve today? The Red Barn was built around 1941 by the Civilian Conservation Corps Indian Division, and many Seminoles contributed to this project. So that was one of the New Deal programs. And initially, the Red Barn housed cattle during the start of the modern Seminole cattle industry. Of course, um, Seminoles have been involved in cattle keeping for forever, pretty much, for hundreds of years. But during this time in the 1940s, cattle were shipped to the Seminole um, to kind of rebuild this industry. So Brighton, which is a reservation where the Red Barn is located, um, it was really the hub of this cattle program. And although it, it definitely thrived in Big Cypress too, and is still um, hugely thriving today, the Seminoles are um, a top cattle producer in the state and in the country. So the Red Barn in Brighton serves initially to house the horses for the cattle industry. But eventually, um, Seminoles were able to kind of, this was kind of a community housing place for horses. So after that, Seminoles were able to have their own cow pens and, and stables. So the Red Barn became kind of a center of the community. In the 1950s, there were a lot of meetings held there um, to form the modern Seminole government. So in 1957, the Seminoles became federally recognized by the United States, and they were they avoided termination as a tribe. So a lot of the meetings that were um, on the Brighton Reservation for the community to come together and to discuss this, this new form of government, they took place at the Red Barn. After that, it wasn't really used, you know, it was used for things here and there, you know, just community meeting places, 4-H programs, and then it kind of fell out of use altogether. Today, it really stands as a symbol of sovereignty and as a precursor for the enterprises that the tribe is known for today. And it's a great, great example of tribal historic preservation I mean, it was actually the first seminal property nominated to the National Register of Historic Places. It doesn't look like a chicky. It does not, no. And, you know, in 1941, almost all structures on the Seminole reservations were chickies. So this is quite a departure from that. It looks like a red barn, as you, as you could imagine. So what's a daily life like for an architectural historian for the Seminole tribe of Florida? 
today my role and responsibilities are a little bit different since I work on the museum side of things. So I only really get to work on these architectural history projects as needed. Interestingly, a lot of buildings that have hit the 50-year mark or historic have done so in recent years. So prior to the 1960s, most of the buildings on the reservations were chickies, which of course those are no longer still standing. And there were a lot of other administrative buildings that are no longer still standing. But during the 1960s, this is when we see a big move into, you know, the so-called modern homes. And many of those are still standing. So I get called upon to conduct architectural surveys um, and assessments when projects could impact these buildings. And, you know, I work very closely with the tribal community in order to form the statements of significance for these buildings. You know, there's not a lot of written records. Um, it's hard to find documentation of these particular homes or other buildings um, from that era. So we often have to um, analyze the historic aerials. But really, we depend mostly on those oral histories. When you're not doing that, what's the regular job that you're doing at the museum? So I'm the visitor services and development manager. So I oversee our membership program. I oversee the education team, uh, which also includes our tour guide. I oversee our development program, which includes fundraising. So those are just kind of a few snippets, help um, oversee marketing, social media. How did you get interested in the Seminole and then brought on as the architectural historian, as well as the other roles that you have today? I studied architectural history and historic preservation in my master's program at the University of Florida. And once I graduated, I moved to South Florida, and my interest really grew in studying the architecture of Seminole. South Florida has its own um, challenges when it comes to significant architectural history, I would say. Um, so pretty much the oldest building here is just barely over 100 years old. I think it's from around 1900. So I was really looking to see, you know, what was South Florida's architectural history and looking beyond um, the obvious, like the Art Deco district in Miami. And, you know, I think there's really nothing that kind of represents that history more than, than the Chicky. It's everywhere and really just shows that, Seminole history is Florida history, it's South Florida history, but it's really, you know, this country's history. So I found that just really fascinating. And it was something um, in school, like I actually didn't study chickies. I don't even think they were mentioned at all. But yeah, I mean, when I moved here, I'm like, this is amazing. And so how did you get hired on with the Seminole tribe? Um, actually, I applied for the job as their architectural historian, and the TIPO at the time, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, Bill Still, he found my resume interesting and, and called me for an interview, and the rest is kind of history. That was 12 years ago. How important is it to the Seminole culture and to the Seminole as a tribe to continue to retain ties with Chickies as examples of their heritage? I think that maintaining culture is maintaining identity. It's maintaining Seminoleness. And, you know, Seminole culture is alive and evolving, of course. But, you know, these critical pieces, um, they can't be lost and they can't be viewed as something of the past. You know, language is another great example of this. Um, and, of course, Chicky Building is a prime example of something that's not just history. Like, yes, there is a historical component but it's, it's modern and it's, it's culture. Why is it correct to say, as Jessica R. Catalino has, that your book is an informative and detailed exploration of chickies at the intersection of architectural history and cultural analysis? So I feel like by focusing on the perspective of architectural history and analyzing the significance from that lens, I felt like I could appropriately talk about chickies as a non-seminal. You know, this isn't my my history per se. So I think that I kind of took the role of, okay, this is the architectural history component. But then when it came to the cultural significance, you know, I really wanted to let the voices of the seminoles themselves speak for that cultural analysis and significance instead of trying to analyze, okay, this is, is this is significant from my perspective. Like I left that up to, you know, the people whose history and culture this actually is. What does the future hold for these unique structures? Well, I definitely expect to see more creative expression um, and the use of new materials in these ever-changing times. I could also envision a return to more chickies, perhaps, reimagined as primary homes 
this is something I saw with former chairman James Billy's house in Brighton. Um, it was a perfect example of a modern living chickie. And I think um, the future could definitely hold more of those, which is really exciting. Carrie Dilly, thank you for joining us for the Seminole Wars. Hey, thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep this show going. Visit our website at www.summonawars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted the Seminole Wars Podcast 2020, all rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden, Roast em, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman, all rights reserved.